Who would like to share? Recording in process. Roger, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you well. Well, thank you so much, so much for joining us here. Uh, there is a large crowd of representatives that know about you, are eager to hear from you, and are committed to transformation. And so any kind of words of guidance, wisdom, et cetera, that you can share with us is much appreciated. So thank you for, for making time. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, hello, colleagues, um, uh, friends. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be with you um, in person. Uh, the the program and topic looks fast, uh, you know, sound, sounds and looks fascinating. And um, uh, I would have loved to join in person, but I'm I, I was stuck and I'm still uh, stuck here uh, on campus this week um, in Boston. So uh, greetings from afar. And what I um, perhaps um, uh, can uh, contribute is um, to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, to link our current moment to, uh, to the moment in education. And um, the other day, um, I was on a panel discussion with uh, Oli Pekka Heinonen, um, the um, former uh, Minister of Education in Finland and head of the um, National Agency for uh, Education in Finland. And so he, in passing, made this remark that really is stuck in my head, um, which is there are really two meta functions of um, all educational systems uh, and all systems of learning, which are one, the transfer of knowledge, and two, capacitating the next generation to uh, create and shape the future. And um, that really is stuck in my head because we know so many processes are organized around the first one, the first meta function. But uh, what is it? Uh, to what degree are we really organizing our institutions of higher ed, um, such as business school, around the uh, second meta function? So that's a little bit the backdrop. And I think it uh, relates to our current moment, um, our current moment uh, we are living in. Um, you, you probably saw, or, or some of you saw, the um, the HDR, the Human Development Report that came out a few weeks ago or a couple of months now. In the meantime, and um, so one number there um, that kind of uh, uh, also stuck in my head is sixty nine. Sixty nine percent, according to the polls uh, the UNDP did, um, sixty nine percent of uh, um, humanity of, of mankind um, says of the respondents said that um, they would be willing to sacrifice part of their income to address uh, global challenges like uh, the, uh, the the global uh, ecological challenges like climate change and 69% um, but most of them said they would see themselves with that view in the minority of in their communities and their society so 69%, that's um, more than 5 billion of us who each think we are in a minority. I, I thought that was really a striking number. Um, it's perhaps the biggest movement in the world that doesn't really exist and does know, even know, that does not know of itself. And um, that, I believe, um, has, um, has, everything to do kind of with uh, with our current moment and also with the um, uh, emerging future role of, of education. I um, um, I see the current moment as a moment of two different narratives. And allow me to, uh, to share perhaps uh, my screen for a little bit. Um, so two narratives, um, one of which is um, the narrative of the poly crisis uh, uh, basically um, that um, you know when you look at the current moment from a systems view what do we see we see that we collectively create results that nobody wants and the form of all the environmental destruction and climate change 
in the form of social divide, um, really meaning um, societies uh, advancing in a process of falling apart. We can witness that here uh, in the US firsthand. Um, and then uh, in terms of the spiritual divide, which really is the pandemic of mental health uh, that we all are, uh, are dealing with in so many different forms. Um, so that's the story we all know. That's the story that's amplified every single day. And yet there's the second story. And the second story uh, is the story of the 69%. It's a story of beginning profound regeneration and renewal. And it's perhaps uh, the most significant story least well told uh, in, uh, in our time, leading among others that these 69% all think um, they uh, happen to be a small minority uh, in their own um, uh, societal uh, context. So um, that's a little bit what I want to dive into, really, this question. So how to uh, activate this dormant potential that you can feel in many places right now that is related to this um, uh, 69%, and yet that, um, in most cases, remains un uh, invisible and also remains in uh, not not activated. Um, systems thinking, uh, which is a little bit my own background, as um, um, as it is the case uh, probably for many of you, really is um, essentially about asking the question why, right? Asking the question. So why are we collectively creating results that no one wants? And these three words: structures, paradigms of thought, and then the deeper sources uh, that we are operating from, sources of energy, of creativity, but also sources of self, really depicting, in a nutshell, the evolution of systems thinking or the deepening, you could say, of systems thinking over the past half century or so. And all these things together is something that I would refer to as awareness-based systems change and can be summarized with these three lines. You cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness, or let me translate that into McKinsey language. You cannot change system unless you transform the mindsets of the people who are enacting that system. Uh, secondly, uh, how do we do that? You can't transform consciousness or mindsets unless you make a system see and sense itself. Well, we knew that for many years, right? Seeing itself is classical systems thinking. But I think what we learned over the past 20 years is this. Seeing is not enough because that is just amplifying the knowing doing gap. We need to activate a deeper source of knowing that has to do uh, with the sensing. We need to feel it. If I am not feeling what it feels like on the other side of say a social divide, I'm very unlikely to let go of some of my own privileges, perhaps. And then number three, you can't lead systems transformation uh, unless you sense and presence the future that's wanting to emerge. So in other words, kind of unless you can connect with the future, embody that and act from that connection in the, in the current moment. Well, how does that work? And that's basically the question that I try to address with the uh, Theory U book and really with the past 20 plus years of, of action research. And it basically boils down to something very simple. It says that, that there are like these two sources of learning, learning by reflecting on the past and learning by sensing and actualizing emerging future possibility. So how do you learn from the emerging future? First and foremost, by moving beyond downloading and by, um, you know, basically getting yourself out of or getting kind of um, your own team or institution out of one's own bubble um, and then go kind of through this kind of three stage process or these three movements. And the first movement really is about um, going to the edges of the system and listening with your mind and your heart wide open, right? That's kind of the, the issue of seeing and sensing, all of that kind of redirecting our attention, all of that is, uh, is essentially um, uh, that kind of 
uh, going to the edges of the system and uh, listening and attending with your mind and heart wide open. Number two, um, retreat and reflect, allow the inner knowing to emerge. So that's, um, you know, a different space. Basically, this is about non-action. It's about stillness. It's about connecting to the deeper levels of our resonance. It's about inquiring into these root questions of who is myself? What is my work? So self with a capital S. So what is my highest future possibility? And the capital capital W work as, you know, my, my sense, what is it I'm here for really? Um, perhaps my sense of purpose or something like that. And then if, if um if uh, a spark or something is uh, beginning to emerge really the the act in an instant the learning by doing um exploring the future by 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 doing so that's how 20 years ago in the theory you book i i summarized um this process today i would just summarize it with three words attention intention agency Attention, if truly deepened, gives rise to intention, to our deepest intention. And intention, if truly clarified and crystallized, gives rise to agency. So that's, and I'm sure kind of we all know that the, you know, episodes of this process and from many different contexts. So that's, I would perhaps uh, 20 years on how I would, uh, in a simplified version, condense the essence of that, uh, a core process of, or, of organizing, not around the past, but organizing around something that's emerging. Um, okay, but um, so that's, um, if you want, that's kind of uh, the last book. But uh, what I wanted to really talk about is the next book. And um, that has to do with an evolution, really, of systems thinking. And as you all, so, so you have seen this kind of thing many times, right? The iceberg model. And in complexity theory and systems thinking, we have been using, as you know, this model for uh, 75 to 100 years, something like that. And of course, um, the question is, okay, 100 years later, um, uh, isn't it perhaps time to come up with something new? Uh, isn't it perhaps time to come up with a new guiding metaphor that best, better fits the current moment we are in, uh, in this century that still keeps, um, keeps unfolding in unique ways, in many unique ways? And um, so two sources of inspiration. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence and a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the entire system to a higher order. So I like that uh, quote by uh, Ilya Prigozhin, or that's attributed to Ilya Prigozhin, um, because it's a little bit like an uh, antidote against the um, pandemic of depression and the, the, the sense of perhaps it's too late and it doesn't really matter what I do, given all these big things uh, that are um, um, that are um, coming over us. So, um, you know, it, it articulates the, the idea of the bifurcation point, right? With a nonlinear system is, uh, is, is in a bifurcation point, small differences can have a huge impact where the system is going. So that's one. And the other one is this, the farm. I grew up on a farm and 65 years ago, my um, parents, when they were young, they decided to move from, it's an old, you know, it's an old farm kind of uh, uh, hundreds of years uh, story and so on. And they decided to switch from conventional agriculture to regenerative agriculture. So if you go up on a regenerative farm, what's the one thing that you pick up, right? It's all about the quality of the soil. It's all about the quality of the roots 
and the soil. That's where your attention goes because the quality of what's growing above the ground is a function of the quality of the soil, the quality of the roots. So if we apply that to uh, the topic of social fields, right? So what we all are dealing with, how does that apply? Of course, we have kind of the visible part of social systems. And usually when people talk about systems, um, they talk about, you know, the third person view, what's what we can observe, kind of the tangible stuff. But then, of course, there's also kind of the social soil, right? The um, What is the functional equivalent of seeds and roots? And I would say it's this. It's the quality of our relationships and the quality of our awareness. So if we apply that distinction and that lens onto the current situation, what do we see? Um, on the you know on the upper side, um, the northern hemisphere here, we see kind of all our sectors and systems that uh, that we are familiar with, and then on the southern side, um, we have the qualities of relationships, and and perhaps you could refer to them as as our operating system, as an evolution of our operating system. And in fact, if I look at my experiences across these sectors and systems on the on the northern side here. The, what I see is the same transformation happening all over, which is from what I call here output and efficiency centric to 2.0 to 3.0 user and stakeholder centric, and from there to 4.0 ecosystem and regeneration centric. So let's look at some examples uh, in food and ag, from industrial agriculture to sustainable, I do less bad, regenerative food as medium for healing planet and people and education as we all know teaching for testing still the mainstream the good school student-centric learning but what is it we are working towards education for human flourishing um whole person whole systems learning and then of course in health kind of from you know the, towards uh patient-centric uh journeys right through healthcare delivery and from there what's um uh sources of health not only human health but planetary health as uh, we have been discussing in, in that community for a while sustainability in business right moving from resource efficiency to esg and product innovation and from there to finally transforming the purpose of business uh, business uh, as a force for good, right? Yes, more conversation about that than perhaps action, but it's a very promising area with some very interesting developments as well. Finance, you know, we all know what the main problem is, right? Too much money in one place, too little in another, right? Too much in the extractive economy and too little in the um, you know, regeneration of our commons. Uh, technology, AI, that would take a whole other session, but let's just say this, how to use the power of AI um, for the well-being of all, right? Creativity in life, enhancing technologies rather than diminishing. And at the end of the day, uh, of course, all of that boils down to governance. And here we see an evolution from the traditional mechanisms, markets and hierarchies, to multi-stakeholder processes, the stuff that everyone is dealing with right now. And from there, uh, perhaps uh, what we see also in many, uh, you know, advanced initiatives right now, something, uh, you know, organizing around shared intention, something I call awareness-based collective action. So basically, um, so you can, what's an example, CSA, right? Kind of community supported agriculture, you organize, economic transaction around a shared intention of regenerative agriculture. So that's a, an example. Uh, we know how to do that small. We don't know how to do that on a planetary scale, even though kind of with the um, Paris Agreement, we have examples also that apply here. Okay, so by now, I'm sure I probably lost um, half of the room and um, now it's getting too complicated uh, here, but I want to offer, I want to assure you, 
the underlying thought is really simple, right? And, and I can offer you a really simple, clear summary. And it, it is this, the underlying thought is this, that the evolution of all our sectors and systems in society can be seen as a manifestation of an evolving human consciousness that moves from ego to ego, that moves from ego and silo-centric to user and stakeholder centric and from there to our ecosystem and regeneration centric and as we progress on that journey something really interesting is happening in this inner sphere right kind of this which is where the boundaries between these sectors collapse and where we move essentially into the same space of renewal regeneration and innovation uh, and it's a space that doesn't have a support structure right now, which I believe has a lot to do with the future role of uh, higher ed. And what are the topics we are coming across here? How to move from extraction to regeneration? How to move uh, from, you know, silo to systems view or ecosystem to ecosystem view? And how to move from reacting against the past towards sensing and actualizing the future, which I uh, refer to or summarize with this word here. That's, I would say, um, kind of um, one uh, trajectory that, that we have been seeing, but let's not kid ourselves. We all know that the mainstream is still stuck here in the outside, trying to move into the middle one, while the innovators in all these sectors move from the middle one into the inner sphere here, the 4.0 sphere. So in working with institutions, particularly those of us working in larger institutions, this is kind of what we often hear. We are trying to solve, that's what practitioners say, right? We're trying to solve 4.0 challenges with 2.0 methods and tools. So there's a mismatch between the challenges coming our way on the one hand and our institutional mechanisms, our, our, our operating system essentially, uh, and leadership tools on the other side. So we are being encouraged to shoot for the moon while some of us are still driving a donkey cart. That, that's, uh, those two things are quotes from UN resident coordinators we have been working in 30 countries with the um, um, UN country teams or the humanitarian country teams, kind of multi-stakeholder groups working together, uh, uh, you know, uh, collaborating in the face of SDG implementation or humanitarian crisis situations. So that was a little bit like, a, it's just, a, you know, the upshot from many, many uh, actual processes. And why is that? So why is it that um, what, that we are still stuck in the outer one or two ways of operating and don't get enough traction into the inner sphere? And the answer to that question has everything to do with the southern hemisphere of this mirror here, with the lower half of this map. Uh, in other words, with the quality of the social soil, with the quality of our relationships. And what I believe the future of education is, is to um, give access kind of to these seven ecosystem leadership practices and capacities that if applied, allow us to really kind of uh, transform the underlying system. And I, you know, it's not many of them will look very familiar, some of them perhaps less. Uh, let me just give the, uh, a quick headline uh, for each. Becoming aware. It's basically in the age of uh, shortening attention spans, making the process of paying attention the central teaching in learning and education today. And um, so it's essentially about paying attention to our attention and uh, responding to situations in a less reactive way. Let me give you an example. If you take uh, a stick and you throw it in front of a dog, the dog is going after the stick. He can't do other. So, so that's what the dog is doing. If you take the same stick, you throw it in front of a lion, 
the the lion turns his head and looks straight at you. The lion is looking at the source, right? The dog is going for the object. The lion lion is turning the head and looking um, straight at the source. How off are we in our lives, in our organizations, and as a society operating in the mode of the dog? And how often in our systems are we operating in the mode of the lion? That's what this one is about, right? It's the capacity to leveling up our attention to, uh, to the next level so that we become aware of how we respond uh, to a situation. And then you could say the other six capacities are just uh, exemplifications of the same meta capacity in the various areas of management and leadership, right? Of course, genitive listening, right? Deepening our listening from factual to empathic to genitive. Um, genitive dialogue, really kind of, so listening essentially, as we said before, is, is a deep listening is about listening with your heart and mind wide open. Genitive dialogue is really about holding the space in a way that different views can come together in a process of thinking and creating together. Um, presencing is really the evolutions of systems thinking, from systems thinking to system sensing to, if you want, systems presencing. Ecosystem imagination, right? Moving from goals like SDGs to really kind of co-sense all their interconnections to co-imagine the future that we want to create, which we need to do and hold space for in very specific ecosystemic contexts. Co-create, cross-sector co-creation is re really by the learning by doing. It's kind of the design thinking applied kind of to these uh, cross-sector levels. And then and the social levels. And then I already talked about ecosystem governance. So that's, um, I would say, is um, one story, one storyline today. But then there is another one, as we all know. We live in the moment of AI. And um, no one knows what the future is going to bring, uh, hold for us. But we have some data. And the data is our first encounter with AI over the past few years in the form of social media. And what does that data tell us? Three unintended side effects, as we all know, mass misinformation, mass polarization, and mass depression. Um, leading to, uh, you know, on the governance side, the, the, the resurgence of autocracy, cacistocracy, the rule of the worst, uh, the least qualified, uh, instead of cross-sector co-creation, fragmentation uh, and war and um, uh, increasing number of cases, dystopian views of the future. Um, then we have um, uh, hyper-inequality, hyper-extraction. Think about the uh, fossil fuel industry, opioidization, Indoctrination using educational systems for that, the fragmentation of attention, um, echo chambers, uh, silencing and othering from the left and from the right. So the question is, are these like 11 separate problems or is it 11 faces of one and the same problem? And if so, what is that problem? I don't have a good name for that, but this is perhaps a working title the matrix of absencing, of really, um, you know, manipulating collective behavior uh, um, effectively uh, on the scale of the whole. And that's why this year is a trillion dollar industry, uh, because it works. So those are two real um, uh, phenomena, two real uh, forces. And in many ways, these seven uh, ecosystem leadership capacities here and practices, um, they can be seen a little bit like an uh, antidote kind of to these um, issues that everyone today, particularly young people, are exposed to. And that going forward probably will uh, 
be amplified, uh, not um, not eased. Um, yeah, so those are the two stories. Kind of one is pulling us in this direction, and then there is kind of this field of potential of regeneration that also is in so many ways has so much momentum, and yet also re remains a story kind of uh, least well told. So if this is true, if this were true, let's put it that way as a hypothesis, then what is our role? What is our role as educators? And um, of course, you know, when you look at society right now, uh, what's missing? We don't have a support infrastructure for any of that. And that's why we lack traction in this kind of inner sphere. Um, and that's perhaps why we have institutions of education and institutions of higher education to prototype that, right? To create islands of coherence that kind of build these capacities, build these capacities that allow us to, to deal with the larger systems transformations as um, needed. And so I think it has, um, it has uh, everything to do with, um, uh, with what brings us together here and the future of uh, uh, education uh, and learning. I started with the distinction between the two meta functions um, of uh, education and learning, uh, no knowledge transfer and um, capacitating the next generation to uh, uh, sense and shape the future to sense and create the future. And um, what it takes, um, I believe, uh, to do that, to really deliver on the second meta function is an extension and deepening of our own system of knowledge and learning. And when you look at kind of current forms of action research uh, and action learning, we usually kind of deal with three types of um, knowledge that are well known, kind of uh, third person knowledge, the objective, and everything in this outer sphere here, uh, you know, is driven by, you know, just objective knowledge, markets, hierarchies, quarterly results, right, kind of that's kind of the form of knowledge that is relevant uh, as a mechanism here. But then as we move into multi stakeholder processes, you need to upgrade that uh, skill set through first and second person knowledge. You need to understand the views of other stakeholders. You need to upskill yourself in accessing subjective and intersubjective ways of knowing. But what I believe that, you know, that's what we've got basically, these three forms of knowledge, and that's where how learning and education is organized around. But that's not good enough. That if I have learned anything in the last 25 years of, as an action researcher, helping communities to go through episodes of profound transformation, it's this, you need to access. Nothing transformative is going to happen unless you access a deeper form of knowing that in a recent article that I believe has been shared with you, kind of uh, with my co-author, Eva Pomeroy, kind of we refer to as fourth person knowing, and um, that's kind of, you can, um, you know, it's like a collective self-knowing kind of, it's kind of a deeper layer of knowing, not only in terms of what is, but also kind of tapping into this emerging potential that I was talking about uh, before. So trans the transformational processes, right, that are related to uh, this inner sphere require us to access a deeper form of knowing. And that's why I believe what we prototype, what we explore in this uh, conference and in this conversation is so critical. Because what often happens today is that we talk about regeneration, but only organizing and using these three known types of knowledge, but not this deeper one that is more personal and more systemic and that is uh, connecting um, with a future that is very personal because it's a future that looks at me 
because that I experience at looking as looking at me because it depends on me and on us to manifest. And that's in fact what can be, so unless you establish this very personal connection, um, we often fail to activate the deeper capacity of really uh, regenerating and transforming our systems as needed today. Summing up, basically what I said is, if, if we want to move from poly crisis to planetary healing and societal regeneration, if we want to do all these good things, we always say we do. In my view, there's only one way we can do it. And that is to shift the quality of relationships, right? To shift the quality of the social fields, uh, the relationships among the stakeholders who are creating these results. In other words, to cultivate the social soil. And if we have learned anything in change management over the past 70 or so years, what is that? It's that you cannot create any behavioral change in larger system unless you create a support infrastructure, innovations in learning infrastructure, not just on an organizational, but in our case now also on a societal level. Uh, which give access to these deeper capacities. It's basically democratizing access to practices, tools, and spaces where you can explore them. And of course, processes that help us to upgrade the operating system and all these sectors and systems we talked about uh, before. Um, in my work as an action researcher, um, you know, uh, with my colleagues at the Presencing Institute and, and the um, U School for Transformation, which is a platform that we created there, uh, we try to contribute to the democratization of the access by uh, with ULab. That's a, a platform where MITx and um, the Presencing Institute uh, has had a significant. Um, not only a significant number of users, but, you know, has really helped them to organize place-based in communities, kind of in initiatives, and really form some of these relationships. So it's an example, and it's a resource. It's a free uh, online available resource. All the methods and tools are really for people like you, uh, people kind of who are multipliers and who are really in the business of, of creating and innovating these new learning environments. And we now complement these uh, with uh, ecosystem leadership gatherings that bring together multi-local initiatives in different uh, world regions. And then, of course, we have the, the sector-specific interventions uh, in a number of cases. Um, so these are a few uh, images of this ecosystem bringing kind of change makers uh, together in the various parts of the world. Uh, in, um, and it is actually quite moving to see. Um, and that's this, the question I started with. I started with the 69% and that this is a movement that's not even aware of itself. So what I believe essentially is What's missing is not the positive intention of individuals. We have that, um, as these uh, surveys uh, indicate. What's missing is the holding spaces, the enabling support structure that allows people to come together in a way that is activating this deeper level of human aspiration. And when you begin to create these holding spaces, it's just amazing the depths of activation, not only individually, but also collectively, what happens. Um, this is actually a gathering, you know, um, this was, um, you know, a couple of months ago in, uh, in Chile, outside of Santiago de Chile, and then the next, um, a, a week-long process, and it's a community of um, uh, 270 change makers over uh, three years that, that meet a few days every year. This is in one of the universities in Santiago, really bringing together the change makers uh, and key leaders across all sectors in society and across the political spectrum. And it's amazing to see 
if you provide these spaces, how willing people are to connect with each other in new ways. And in a way, transformative processes are not more difficult today, they are a lot more easy. And why is that? Because we all experience this moment of disruption. We are kind of in this planetary process of letting go and letting come, where one system is ending and dying and something else is trying to be born and in the process of being born. And many people feel they see what's happening with polarization and we are moving into a dead end and they feel now is the time to show up. And now is the time to move, to connect with each other in new ways. So uh, in closing, if we want to do this, we have to cultivate the social soil. We have to shift the quality of the eco of the eco of the stakeholder relationships. And if you want to do this, we need innovations in learning and leadership infrastructures that allow us to align attention, intention, and agency, not only on the level of the individual, not only on the level of the organization, but really on the level of the whole. That's all I have. Thank you, Otto. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. So any comments and questions from the audience? Or both comments and or questions? Yes, Rani and Aisha. Thank you so much. You mentioned the importance of holding space. What are some of the insights that you gathered from your experience that are critical about holding the space in the right way for those connections insights to happen? I would say that the first thing that comes to my mind, I mean, I would be interested in your experience, but my experience is probably the most under leveraged resource we have is uh, Mother Nature. That's the most powerful holding space of all. So for example, in my, my um, class here, um, my residential class at MIT, um, but also in, in workshops here um, on campus and so on, I send people out to a dialogue wall quite uh, regularly. And that's, um, I, I, I showed you the, some of the pictures uh, in, in the closing slides. Of course, you can, um, you can amplify that a lot if you go to the right kind of places. But, you know, it's uh, the access to nature is um, uh, varies uh, from place to place. So sometimes it's more easy, sometimes it's less. But usually there's always something. So that's one resource. Um, another for a holding space. Um, then another one is, of course, what we are using in... Um, uh, in uh, in Latin America in particular is indigenous ways of knowing, kind of bringing in uh, indigenous elders as partners, but not only uh, you know, uh, coming in for a ceremony and, come, and going out, but really participating as full participants and, and full uh, also colleagues, if you want, in holding that space. Um, that, of course, um, is contributing, you know, it, it depends on the context, but uh, clearly in that context that has where everyone is sharing the same history, which is the history of um, colonization, um, that, um, that in that context, of course, kind of this partnering out, kind of this um, widening and deepening of the holding space, um, including some uh, healing ceremonies, plays a big role, I would say. Um, and then, um, of course, um, the, the most important thing, I mean, uh, just to be very practical, whatever the process is you use, regardless, I mean, uh, the, the one thing I always try to do early on is to bring in everyone's, everyone's person's voice, right? Now, if you have smaller groups, you do it in a circle. If you have hundreds or thousands, 
you do many, many circles and then some pop up uh, cross um, table sharing or something like that. But it's that's the principle, right? Everyone's voice, because you, you need to awaken the going through this deeper process that you can refer to as you process or otherwise, right? It doesn't really matter, is essentially a process of awakening, waking up in places where before we were asleep. And um, uh, and for that, you need to activate um, the self. And by bringing, you need to act, well, well, you need to presence the self. You, you, you need to allow the self and all the different layers of experience uh, to become present in the room and to be listened to. So those would be, and in many ways, uh, I mean, I mean that that is true for many um, um, for many community building processes that you are uh, probably familiar with. Being listened to has an incredible power, and I think the absence of being listened to is what I refer to as attentional violence. If you are not seen in terms of who you really are, that's attentional violence. That's where the whole problem with, with what later manifests as direct and also as structural violence is starting. And um, addressing that at the root is really um, deepening the capacity of listening and creating space for all the different voices uh, relevant to a situation or that are in the room, or also that perhaps are not in, in the room, kind of to, to be attended to and to be heard. And there is, um, when that happens, as we all know, there is often like um, a strange alchemy working, right? So that uh, it's not that everything is solved, but it's, um, it's more, um, you create a more stable foundation on which you can deal with very difficult issues and divisive issues differently. And in an age of polarization, it's not good enough to just protect the few resources of commonality that we still have, right? And, and defense of, you know, certain values and so on. I think kind of the, 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 the challenge is much bigger now. The challenge is how do we regenerate um, these shared foundations in places where they have gone. And that's why this um, art and practice of holding these deep spaces for regeneration is a key, uh, is foundational really for, for the years and the decades to come. And we can regenerate them. It's not like a one-way street just because it, it's fading and diminishing in the past decades and uh, centuries that uh, it always continued that way. No, we, we can actually turn that around. And um, what is inspiring me is actually how fast, how much a difference you can make because of course the transformation of the human spirit is not is nonlinear, right? It, it, it's not like drip, 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 one drip at a time. The, the, trans, the, the waking up to the situation at hand can happen in an instant. So there is a lot that can happen in positive ways in a very short amount of time, but it requires these holding spaces. And that's why the work we do and whether or not we as a community can um, transform higher ed and transform uh, places like business schools is um, of such a critical importance for um, for the years to come. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Ned. Uh, hello, I'm Stoic Dan from Orlando, Florida. And uh, one of the things we include in our classes is this uh, uh, ways of inspiring students to take action, whether we go back to Aristotle or the Stoics, people who are very pragmatic in their philosophy. I'm curious, when you talk about learning by doing and, and acting on your sense of purpose, what are your inspirations through history? What great thinkers or philosophers or others do you look to? Well, I have been, um, 
I have been uh, much influenced, actually, and uh, I am adapted uh, quite a bit. I came here uh, to MIT really because I wanted to learn, immerse myself into the tradition of action research and action learning, which um, which I couldn't really find um, uh, in the universities um, uh, in, in in Germany back then. So, um, and I am so the tradition of action research, uh, including Ed Schein, uh, Kurt Lewin, um, that has um, influenced. So, basically. Um, now, so one practice, right, that I'm still using today, that I'm actually often in, in ULAB, it's, it's, it's one of the first practices, is empathy walk. So it's, it's you could say it's pre-action because there is before you, so I think, um, yes, action matters, but before that, there's something else. You need a sense. You, you need a kind of... Um, uh, you need to connect with the larger field around you. And this practice, um, empathy walk, is um, you pair up the students, they identify a person that's maximum opposite to them, politically or socially, whatever, class, whatever it is, and then find that person and be a guest in that person's lives for a couple of hours. So it's, of course... Uh, you know, terrifying, right? When you read that, and um, then they do it, and it's um, it's um, uh, and then they they write a paper, or an individual paper, a reflection on that, and that's kind of like a, a micro sequence. And then a little later, now uh, I also let them do the same kind of empathy walk with their significant other, right? Kind of a, a close friend. Often that's turns out to be much more challenging. But um, apart from that, what I, what I want to say is the way I think about um, action learning is that um, there are three things overrated and three things underrated in higher ed today and in business schools in particular. What's overrated is number one, knowledge. So what's the underrated complement? Not knowing. The problem with knowledge is that everything that is really important, including the entire future, we don't know. But we need to act now. What do you do then? You need to learn how to access not knowing. Or as Ed Schein, that I just uh, referred to, um, uh, used to call it, access your ignorance. If I have learned anything that's useful in my own consulting practice, that's one of the most because you orient your attention to your ignorance that makes you asking questions that are so much more helpful in a situation. So overrated knowledge, underrated uh, X, so, so not knowing. The second thing overrated is uh, being comfortable. And um, underrated, they're obviously kind of uh, accessing your discomfort. Anything that deals with our blind spots in institutions, with structural violence and like systemic racism and so on and so forth, requires us, requires leaders to access discomfort. We know from our leadership training that as long as people are comfortable uh, in that training, nothing behaviorally relevant is new, is learned, nothing. You only learn new stuff that uh, is, is, is relevant in terms of new behaviors when you access your discomfort. So that's number two. And the third one is action. Now, what can be possibly wrong with action? Don't we all uh, talk about action? And the answer to that question is, if you jump right away, to, uh, right away to action, what are you going to do? Download, right? You react, you reactivate standard operating procedures. And of course, that's what we see all the time. It's the dog, not the lion. What's the lion doing? Non-action. So that kind of, it's kind of this Taoist principle, right? Leading through, what is a different word for non-action? It's stillness. Access your stillness. I would say that's the, the third principle. 
So access your ignorance, access your discomfort, and access your non-action. I think kind of those are the three things unnarrated in higher ed in general and business schools in particular. And that's where the real leverage point is for, for practical leadership skill development. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Lourdes. Hello. Um, it's been really enlightening to hear your talk. And my question is, um, uh, is how what can help us move uh, beyond focusing on solving problems and move more towards um, learning from that emerging possibilities? Sorry, can you say that the, the last line again? So moving from solving problems to what? Yeah, for focusing from focusing on solving problems to envisioning the possibility and, and creating the conditions to make it real. You're totally right. I, I mean, uh, yeah, there's so much focus on problem solving, and 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 everyone thinks kind of that's kind of uh, so practical and so good, and it, it's true here as well. Um, I believe with the assumption that I heard, right, that so if you, I mean, that, what is the problem with problem solving? Well, you already start on the wrong foot. You, you, you start by having defined already uh, an issue that then goes all the energy in. While um, if you go through the U process, what the real issue is keeps changing, right, keeps morphing. And um, so you, in other words, the, the generative and the co-creative and the emerging. So if you start with sensing, it, um, it can surface emerging possibilities that are not limited by this current problem solving mindset. So um, I am. Um, I agree with that, and that's when you look into the methodologies that we have been developing. So uh, I don't know. So something that it's actually interesting. So we um, in the Presencing Institute that I founded together with um, co-founded together with um, uh, among others Arana Ayashi, kind of uh, she's a dancer, artist, um, meditation teacher. Um, and um, so she, um, I, I played a very small role in that, but she basically um, developed in the Presencing Institute a whole line of practices that we call social presencing theater. And it's basically forms of embodied learning. And so I, as a user, so when I'm in the classroom, I do a lot more, right? Even though, so I have half the group is, um, um, uh, mid-career executives from MIT or Harvard, and then half of the group is uh, MBAs. So it's kind of all the traditional views you can imagine. Um, but, you know, I was a lot more hesitant a few years ago kind of to throw at them social presencing theater. That has gone. Because what, um, what, I, re what I realize is how much more open people are today to our embodied forms of learning, to really new ways of learning that move you beyond um, this intelligence, right? This is a brilliant device, but the, the limitation, of course, is we, we always look back, right? We reflect on what is. If you want to connect with the emerging future, we need to activate these sensing devices as well. And that's where... Um, uh, so many of the tools that, that you can find, um, uh, for example, on the Presencing or the U School for Transformation website, the Presencing Institute website, is has a structure that moves from sculpture one to sculpture two. And we so and what you said is exactly the first line of the inst instruction. It, this is not a problem solving technology. Because problem solving is you define this thing and then you apply the hammer, so to speak, right? So no, this is, so uh, the personal version of that that I often use, use as an entry point is actually called stuck, right? You, what is stuck? It's kind of um, 
situation where stuff isn't moving, right? And then you think about an example and then you make people embody that, right? So of course you need a role model of that as faculty. So then you do that. So um, then everyone does that and then you move. So that's kind of the current reality. And then the whole methodology is about that the emerging future is already present in the current moment. So in other words, everything you need is already dormant there, right? And rather than fixing the problem, you try to, so each stack is a gold mine of information. And you try to unearth that. You try to, you know, to, uh, to connect with that kind of um, emerging future possibility that is already dormant in the current situation. So it's a long way of saying, um, and, and you can see all the related resources and also examples on the um, U School for Transformation website, uh, that we need a new set of methods and tools that is not limited by the currently dominating problem-solving mindset but that allows people, that gives them concrete methods and tools. Listening is one, dialogue is another one, but you know these embodied forms of learning, uh, including kind of modeling with objects or modeling kind of with your own body, are all doing the same thing, which is connecting with what is and what is wanting to emerge, kind of the dormant reality that is already present in the current moment different. So you could say um, there's really two ways of how in uh, higher ed we talk about the future, right? One is from the head. It's kind of scenarios and kind of, um, you know, basically extrapolation of trends and so on and so forth, kind of the mental view. And um, the other uh, way of connecting is to blend this way of connecting, the reflective, with this which is the sensing and the feeling. And the connection point is not a projection into the future, but it's a deepening of the connection in the current moment. And that has everything to do with the distinction that you suggested. So sensing deeper, it's not like problem fixing it, but sensing deeper into what is and what is wanting to emerge. And using, so when you bring that into your awareness, using the guidance, the energy, and uh, the power of that transformative capacity. It may sound, if you have never seen anything like that, it may sound darn abstract. And so I apologize for that. Uh, probably the best thing is then to look at a few examples. For those of you who have experimented with embodied forms of learning, particularly in the age of collective depression that we are now in, I have found that one of the most direct ways because you cannot lecture anyone out of their depression. You need to give them methods and tools and practices that is accessing a different level of self-knowing. And uh, it has everything to do with the distinction you gave. Thank you so much, uh, Otto, for sharing and well, also doing it. Thank you. If you can't hear, there's an applause going. You can imagine what that looks like. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.